My name is Arne Behrensen. I work for an industry association in Germany of the bicycle industry, Zukunft Fahrrad. And we have here a lot of other associations. Uh, we have SEM of Cycling Industries Europe, and we have the National Cycle Logistics Federations from Germany, that's Tom, from Belgium, that's Philippe, and from France, that's Gaetan. And our session now is about the cargo bike movement and what it needs, and the cargo bike industry and what it needs um, to go on. Uh, we need great speakers like Martin, we need marketing, we need good bikes, great cargo bikes, more cargo bikes, but what we also need in order to convince policymakers and media is data and to collect serious data, we need strong institutions. We need to institutionalize and produce data that can convince people. We had in the past years um, a continuous series of uh, EU-funded projects. The Cycle Logistics Project 1, Cycle Logistics 2, and then the City Changer Cargo Bike Project. I also see Anna Karina from the European Cyclists Federation here, who was involved. Uh, Richard Armitage was involved for the European Cycle Logistics Federation. Um, from this last CCCCB, City Changer Cargo Bike Project, we developed the European Cargo Bike Industry Survey to answer the question on how many cargo bikes do we have on the streets and are produced or sold every year. Uh, that's what we want to talk about uh, now and all the institutions that are involved. I hand over to Sam of Cycling Industries Europe at that moment for some further introductions. Thanks, Anna. Uh, not much more to add, I don't think. Um, uh, obviously, CIE, uh, Cycling Industries Europe, representing the cycling ecosystem at the European level, if you're not familiar with us. Um, but yeah, with Anna, through the support of the CCCB Cargo Bike Project, um, also with ECF, who are producing a lot of good material, great material at the moment, the dashboard that Anna Karina presented earlier today, uh, the subsidy um, uh, platform that they also have in place. I mentioned that yesterday in one of the sessions. Um, that's also a great resource, I think, uh, for cargo bikes, for people looking to purchase cargo bikes for professional or personal use. So I think there's, you know, between our three associations, there's a lot of data and, and information that's being produced. You know, it's often one of the only sources for this sort of data. Um, and I think it's really important for the work that, uh, that we, I think we all want to see, you know, more cargo bikes uh, on the streets, uh, whether that's, you know, cargo bike sharing. Uh, I see Yaron in the audience, and I think that's obviously a really valuable way to get cargo bikes on the street, given the sort of high price point for cargo bikes. But then obviously, um, you know, improving industry standards to improve uh, the, the sort of reliability, durability, um, uh, improve machine uh, production efficiencies for, for, for cargo bikes. Obviously, we follow regulation as well. And, and as, as uh, Martin mentioned, you know, there's all this sort of scare campaigning at the moment uh, about cargo bikes. But, you know, by, I think we all agree that they solve a lot more problems than they produce. Um, and, you know, we need to keep a close eye on what happens at the regulatory level uh, to ensure that, you know, this isn't something that gets um, regulated into, uh, you know, irrelevance. Um, so, yeah, again, uh, data and information is what, you know, we do as associations and uh yeah lobbying to to improve the 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 landscape for, for cargo bikes and cycling um but yeah maybe if we sort of focus on the the 2023 survey uh that we did uh earlier this year uh was divided into manufacturers and operators so in the past as anna said through the cccb project um the 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 initial focus was on manufacturers and we obviously saw the need to focus on cycle logistics as well. Um, it's not just about production and sales and, and growth of cargo bikes throughout Europe for personal and professional, but it's also about tracking how uh, those cargo bikes are being used in a professional uh, in a professional capacity. So that's why there was the operator survey developed as well shortly after, I think a year after the first manufacturer survey. And that's given us really good data uh, around safety, around local jobs, 
uh, around um, around the sort of growth of that psychologistics sector as well. Uh, and I will speak about that shortly. But maybe Anna, if you want to sort of go into the manufacturers one first, and yeah, we'll we'll then proceed. Um, we'll sort of go through the survey results that we 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 um, received this year, and then we'll also hand over to the associations for them to explain a little bit more about themselves. Um, and then uh, we will finish up uh, with a little uh, surprise. Okay, so I start with uh, the manufacturer survey we did so far. It was an annual survey. We presented uh, results at Eurobike. Um, involved the Cycling Industries Europe, uh, Zukon Farad and Sporting Insights, who did the, the technical uh, handling of the data which was anonymous, we'll come to that now. Basically what we did is we were sending an anonymous online survey around and asked manufacturers um, to answer it. Um, the main question was how many cargo bikes did you sell in Europe two years ago, last year, and how many do you expect this year? Um, 43 companies, manufacturers answered the questionnaire, 38 from EU member states, and one other European um, manufacturer, and four from uh, outside Europe. We definitely have more cargo bike manufacturers in Europe and international, so this is just a piece of the market that the survey covers. We don't cover the total sales numbers with that. Um, but it's interesting to see the difference between the survey uh, participant uh, in terms of size of the company, for example. Four out of these uh, 43 expect to sell more than 10,000 cargo bikes in Europe this year. Uh, 12 of them expect to sell less than 100 cargo bikes this year. So we have a diverse industry. We don't have a company selling 100,000 cargo bikes yet. It will take a few uh, years still. And we have a lot of uh, smaller companies. Um, the respondents cover more or less the whole spectrum of cargo bikes uh, that are out there. Cargo bikes for private use, for commercial use, uh, with two, three or four or more wheels. No, not, <laughs> I don't know a cargo bike with more than four wheels, so that's a mistake in the presentation. Uh, with and without electric assist, the survey results show a high, very high degree of uh, electrically assisted cargo bikes. And also it covers manufacturers who produce um, light cargo bikes and also uh, heavy cargo bikes with up to 500 uh, kilogram total maximum weight. Um, this is uh, what they answered on their sales in Europe. Uh, so these are not, and I have to say it again because it's getting misinterpreted uh, very often, these are not total sales number in Europe of cargo bikes. These are the combined sales numbers of the 43 anonymous survey participants. Um, so it's a part of the market. But what is interesting here is the growth that these 43 cargo bike manufacturers see. They, they said they sold uh, 82,000 cargo bikes in uh, 2021. It rose to 112,000 uh, in 2022. And then the growth, um, yeah became less. You all know the difficult context of our industry. Um, and now it's, they expect 120,000 um, for this year. This is still a growth. Uh, and that's different from the uh, cycling industry, uh, the total cycling industry, where we can, uh, I think, expect, uh, if we're happy, to be more or less plus minus zero. Um, for this year. So the cargo bike industry, the cargo bike manufacturers still see a little growth this year. And we hope soon we will get back to the uh, growth rates of 30-40% we have seen in uh, previous years because we just need quickly more cargo bikes on the streets. And our next 
manufacturer survey starting probably in April next year. You will all receive a link through various uh, channels. Uh, then will show us um, how the real sales of this, again, anonymous uh, participants will be and how it will develop further. Interesting, we also asked the manufacturers, what are your three main markets in Europe? Um, Germany stands out first because it's obviously a big country. Um, but then second, France. Third, Belgium, though it's a rather small uh, country. Uh, Netherlands fourth, and then came the rest is uh, rather um, less relevant in terms of top markets, not in relevance as such, of course. Um, so the German market and the French market, obviously very important, and also uh, the Belgian market. Um, conclusions uh, and next steps. The cargo bike market, as I said, is uh, growing despite uh, challenging times. And uh, we need, especially in these times of crisis, we need more political support uh, to realize the full potential of the cargo bike industry. Um, and the survey needs more manufacturers to participate. The more data we have, the more reliable data we have, the better we can argue for um, uh, uh, also in the political uh, fields to uh, take cargo bikes seriously and to investors. Um, and uh, that's what we have discussed right before uh, this panel this morning. To make the survey more effective, we need strong institutions, national associations of the cycle logistics sector and others, um, who are close to the manufacturers. When we do a European survey that's coming out of Brussels and sent to random manufacturers in Italy and Spain um, or Sweden, and we don't have a real close connection, they think, oh, a survey link oh, it takes me 15 minutes. Should I really do it? Why is it important? And if you have national institutions of the cargo bike industry that are close to... Uh, the manufacturers, it's much more convincing. They can make the argument with their constituency. Um, we need you to answer this survey because it's important for all of us uh, and for you. Um, we have full survey um, results available through uh, Cycling Industries Europe. Speak to Sam if you're interested in the full survey results. And at that moment, I hand over to Sam, because as we said, the survey was split into manufacturers and sales of cargo bikes and operators of uh, cargo bikes. And that's Sam's case. Thank you, Anna. Um, so for the operator survey, um, this was run at the same time uh, and was obviously targeted to the cycle logistics operators throughout Europe. Um, we again had a, a response rate of 25 respondents. So, I mean, obviously that's not the entire cycle logistics sector, uh, and, and, um, we would like to improve that number. So, you know, working with the, the, the guys you see up on, on the panel, uh, today, you know, we, we, uh, working more closely with them to improve our response rate, improve the, 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 the accuracy and relevancy of our data. But I still think, um, this response rate and, and, and the type of responses that we received uh, indicate the, the continued growth of this sector and, the, and obviously the continued importance of the sector. Um, I mean, in terms of representation, France and Germany dominate. And I think that's relative to the fact that that's where cycle logistics is really the most um, embedded in, 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 in you know, delivery and uh, courier type work. Um, but I think there is obviously other areas, Netherlands, where, you know, there can be more, uh, more work around, uh, reaching out to, to the psychology, like psychologistics community here and, and, and obviously throughout the rest of Europe as well. So that is something that as a, uh, with, with the associations up on the stage here, we will be working with, uh, uh, uh represent representatives of other countries, trying to sort of build out uh, a bit more of an association network, 
um, throughout Europe. So, so that is something that we have. Uh, we hope we will have more news on uh, in the future. Um, it's a goal, uh, and and yeah, we are we're working towards yeah greater representation of uh, associations throughout Europe in in the years to come. Um, but uh, you know, growth of 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 local jobs. This is obviously an extremely important sort of uh, metric. And um, okay, we see um, this was up one percent, which okay, not huge, but still showing growth in 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 cycling in the cycling industry at the moment. That's not what a lot of people can talk about. So I think I think that's uh, this year. You know, it's been a tough year for a lot of people. So I think that's that's been that's positive. And then obviously in terms of uh, annual revenue, um, there has been. Uh, it's actually unfortunately been cut. Uh, you can't quite see it, but um, it was up 63% year on year. Uh, so there's been uh, a very large growth in uh, annual revenue uh, for the for the companies that we survey. So the growth is is definitely there in this sector. Um, whether it's in employees, whether it's in um, in in the in the actual revenue that those uh, companies are generating. So it's all I think very positive. Um, and then obviously reflective of the fact that there is an increase in revenue, there is obviously more kilometers being traveled. And to the extent that it was twice that of, of the survey results in 2022. But again, I think an important metric to see uh, that this industry is growing and it's using in the infrastructure that on the roads and, and, and there is a need to build out that infrastructure. Um, again, there's a lot of sort of, fear-mongering about cargo bikes using cycling infrastructure. What does that mean for pedestrians? What does that mean for cars? Um, with you know, strong, adequate cycling infrastructure, um, there's obviously a huge opportunity for the efficiencies of cycle logistics, for, for, for cycle logistics to achieve the efficiencies that, that we, we know that it's capable of, and, and to obviously ensure a safe system uh, in, in, in road safety and a safe system for all road users. So I think uh, this this sort of metric around the uh, the amount of kilometers traveled is extremely important because uh, it shows that this this infrastructure is being used, whether it's for personal uses or whether it's for professional commercial use case as well. Um, both are both are very important. Um, what we would like to look at for 2024, um, a few months ago, a couple months ago, um, the European Commission. Uh, made a commitment through the European Cycling Declaration. Um, uh, there's, not sure if you've read it, it's a six-page document that sort of highlights the areas that the Commission is going to prioritize in terms of its cycling investment and, and support over the next uh, period. It's linked to the European institutions' um, uh, goals around the Green Deal, around the Fit for 55 um, uh, legislation. So, um, yeah. Cycling is obviously, as we know, a way a way to to achieve many of the goals that those documents are trying to to achieve, and this declaration sets forward the uh, the, the 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 path for for further cycling support and and, and investment in the years to come. Uh, one very important, I think, um, article in that document is this Article Twenty Nine, where there is a specific reference to supporting cycle logistics. And strengthening the integration of cycle logistics into the logistics system. So this is this is obviously on the commission's radar, and this is something that we need to hold the commission to in the future in terms of urban planning documents, in terms of funding, in terms of um, uh, support through 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 policy work. So um, here it is written in black and white, uh, and and this is something, as I said, that we will be. Uh, following very closely and, and making sure that there is the investment required to, to make this sector grow for obviously the benefit of, of uh, everyone. Um, and, and as I said you know earlier on, this data that we're collecting feeds into this narrative of, of improving the cycle logistics uh, system. You know, we can show that there is an increase in kilometer cycle. We can show that there's an increase in local jobs. We can show that there's an increase, that this is a profitable uh, um, uh, exercise as well and that there are increases in revenue uh, coming now as well and it can be that much more um, uh, beneficial if the requisite re amount of, inf of, of investment and, and, and support is given by uh, at the European level. So yeah, that's where, where, that's where essentially this data is going to, to make that, uh, make that, that um, 
claws there a reality. Uh, and as I mentioned, yeah, we will be, and Anna as well, we will be working uh, increasingly closely with the the, um, uh, psycho- the National Psychologistics Associations. Obviously, they've got uh, very close, good contacts with whether it's manufacturers in countries or, or, or local psychologistics operators. And, and, you know, this is the sort of grassroots um, uh, support and, 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 and um, uh, outreach that we need to, to be able to get the, the, the data that is really important at the European level. So this is um, a space that is, is developing and growing. And uh, as I said, we will uh, be back uh, in the years to come, I think, with some, some very positive stories uh, to talk about. So um, with that, I will hand over to uh, the Belgian Psychologistics Federation, uh, my colleague Philippe. Who, uh, Thank you very much, Sam. Time. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here to speak about the BCLF, the Belgian Psychologistic Federations. Um, I will not dive into detail of sur- the recent survey we did. I invite you to come back at 3.10 because we have uh, with my colleague uh, Amori who is there. We are going to dive into what we call our first barometer for Belgium. So it will be very interesting to, for you to get all the insight about the sector. But today I want more to speak about the existence of the Psychologistic Federation and why it is important uh, to exist. So what is a Psychologistic Federation? It's a federation of members and the members are those companies, organizations that deliver everyday products or services. And we represent them. So we we like to say that the federation does not exist without its members. We are there for them. We are there to grow, to help to grow the sector and to create favorable conditions so that the sector can grow. So what I want to speak about and present to you today is just a few things. Um, It's first, you know, high level, what is the vision of the BCLF? And uh, the BCLF, actually our vision, what drives us, how do we project ourselves in the future is that by 2030, we want psychologistics to be at the heart of urban logistics. So that means that there shouldn't be any urban logistics without last mile being based on with, on, with the use of cargo bike of all kinds. Um, it should be there, it should be present, and there is a big potential. We are going to speak about that at 3 o'clock. The mission of the BCLF is to be the voice of the sector. So basically, we represent the sector, and like I said, uh, we want to get the favorable conditions from the stakeholders so that the sector will grow and will reach its vision, its potential. That's what our reason of existence as a federation. And then we have worked and defined what are our values. Um, so we have a couple of values, innovative. I- innovative, not in the sense that we are there to create things which do not exist today and that are fancy. No, we, are, we like to say that we are not reinventing the wheel. I think is a good expression when you speak about cargo bikes. We want to use existing technology, but to bring us forward. So existing concepts that are needed to be put in practice for the future. We have another value, which is generative. We see the future as a shift to a sustainable society. So that means sustainable from a environmental standpoint, economical and social as well. Um, This is a fundamental thing for the Federation. We are open. We believe that we are not going to achieve or vision without a collaboration, a broad collaboration. So it's a collaboration within the sector, but also essentially also with external stakeholders. We, we don't oppose ourselves to the classic transporter. We want to collaborate. We believe that psychologistics is the best solution for the last mile in, in cities. So we need a collaboration. We need to, ob- to be open for that collaboration. We are ambitious. You see, we want to be at the heart Um, of of urban logistics. We also um, define our vision with the name of a project that we call Route 33, and we'll explain you later why at 3 o'clock. That's a big ambition. And finally, um, and this is also very key for us, fundamental, we are human-centric. So we don't don't believe in urban logistics that will be done by uh, automated uh, vehicles, robots, uh, we believe in the human is needed for the value that it brings. And at the end, for the smile 
when he brings the goods or the services to the end user, to the customer, basically. So we put a lot of emphasis of this aspect um, in our federation. There you go. I now we'd like to speak uh, why a federation is important in terms of its mission. So at the BCLF, uh, we've built our mission around this pyramid. Uh, it's quite simple um, and easy to understand. At the basis, we have the, the, the fundamental uh, stone of this pyramid is the inform role of the federation. So the federation is there to gather data because we spoke about data, we spoke about survey. Data is fundamental to understand the sector, to understand the evolution. Um, we speak about quantitative data as well as qualitative data. So the federation does surveys to their members, but also to, to, to organizations which are not yet their members. Um, but we also conduct projects, projects to understand how psycho logistic works from an operation standpoint. What's the efficiency? Um, how does it compare to the traditional logistics? Um, so this is only very key data to understand how psychologistics will contribute to the future, basically, and the evolution of it. And it's the basis for the next level in the pyramid, which is the role of representation. So we like to say that the BCLF needs to be present everywhere. We need to be involved. Um, you know, Belgium is a small country, but relatively complex from an organization standpoint. We have a federal level, we have a regional level, and we have a local level. So we need to be present at all levels, in all the discussion, when they speak about the future of logistics, of transport, of mobility, um, in any project that speak about uh, Green Deal and, and sustainable future. Psychologistics needs to be present to bring its contribution to be taken into account in the design of the future. So the Federation spent a lot of time in this part um, with Amory, my colleague, we, we started in February and we had more than 300 contacts in Belgium to get them aware about, about psychologistics because most of the people even don't understand what it is. So our role is to make them aware, to spread the word and to be involved. Um, and that's uh, fundamental. And finally, we have what we call the link uh, aspect of the federation. This is really building a community uh, within the federation, with the members, but obviously going outside the federation as well in Belgium. So linking the psychologistics operators with classic transporter, looking how we are going to work together, what are the hurdles, obstacles to move to psychologistics. So we need to create that collaboration. How do we do that? We organize events, we organize work groups, uh, webinars, um, all kinds of ways to connect the people together and um, so that we can, like I mentioned, we are open, we want to create collaboration between the various stakeholders. So in this part, we, we, make, that, uh, we make that possible. Um, obviously, I want to add that I'm here with my European colleagues. So um, the link is also on the European level and that's quite important. Um, as Sam mentioned about um, the, the future emphasis of Europe on, on cycle. And so we need, as all federation here, present here, to act together so that we can get a good support and a big support on European level to push forward um, cargo bikes and cycle logistics. So that's also a very, uh, very important. And I think we, I'm very happy to see that we have a very good uh, dynamic with all the colleagues here. Um, we are here for two days together and we really feel the energy and the willingness to work together um, we have many things in common and the fact that we, we can exchange together will help us to, to go faster. Um, we, we learn from each other. Um, the French people are quite advanced, I would say, and we are always keen to learn about what they did, etc. So the same with the Germans. So we are a bit like the young guys and the, the new in the, in, in the domain, but uh, we learn fast as well. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an important part, uh, the European front on psychologistics, and we have a lot to do still there. So that, that's a little bit concludes my part. Uh, the Federation of Psychologistics is quite important to develop the sector. The potential is big. And, yeah, we are very excited to, uh, to move forward and to get there. 
I'm giving the word to my colleague Tom. You have a mic. Perfect. Is the mic working? Yeah, wonderful. Hello, I'm Tom. I'm representing the German Cycle Logistics Federation. And as German Cycle Logistics Federation, we see ourselves as the network and the voice for the cycle logistics ecosystem. So what is special about our association is that we represent cargo bike manufacturers, cargo bike operators, but additionally the entire ecosystem from research to retailers to component manufacturers to software companies and so on, which is necessary to push the cargo bike industry forward and to get more and more cargo bikes on the street. And our aim is that by 2030, we want to have 30% of urban commercial transport done by cargo bike. This is a tough challenge, and especially with German politics right now, it is a really hard challenge, but we still think it's doable, and even more things that it's necessary to do. And so doing this work of always raising the voice to get cargo bikes on the street to make streets sustainable and safe, we were often asked, what are the numbers? How many cargo bikes are out there? How many cargo bikes are sold? What, what are the jobs you create? And so on. And so in 2021, we started to do our uh, reports on the cargo or cycle logistics ecosystem. What we do in our reports is basically we ask the entire ecosystem, not just, so we ask the manufacturer, so we have one report, we send out to everybody who's doing something with cargo bikes and with, for commercial use with our members and also our non-members. And we then distinguish within the report between are you an operator, are you a manufacturer, or do you do something else? And we ask for sales numbers, we ask for employees, we ask for turnovers, and this is how we structure our report and what we uh, ask for. And what is pretty variable, what we considered a, and recognized it at each, so we try to have the same structures, the same questions every year, but at the end of each year we will have a yearly a part with some specialized questions uh, to add and to be able to adopt our survey to current political issues, to current trends, and so on. Here are some numbers. I did not manage this morning to translate it into English. Basically, the results of our last or this year's survey is that currently our entire sector in Germany is producing at least 4,000 jobs with operators, with uh, cargo bike manufacturers. And we are just asking the manufacturers for commercially used cargo bikes, not for private used cargo bikes. This is important to note. Uh, but what's more interesting, we even had a pretty high job growth of more than 1,000 people. And we have feeling that even within this very small cargo bike industry, there's a high pressure on labor force and for companies to find good employees and well-trained employees. The turnover is 175 million in total for the cycle logistics industry in Germany. And sales for cargo, or we don't ask for cargo bike sales, we ask for cargo bike production. And this had been 27,000 cargo bikes produced for commercial use or most dominantly for commercial use. So we don't cover the private use cargo bikes because we do cycle logistics and focus on the cycle logistics in the use. We publish our report yearly. It's a QR code. You can find the link to our current report. It has some more uh, figures and numbers with it. Unfortunately, it is in German. For next year, when we also will do a joint uh, survey, we will also use DeepL to translate it in English. Thanks to AI, this is now pretty handy. And what we discovered, what we will continue to do and what works very well is to work with our research partner, TH Wildau, and also to make online press conferences to get people informed and to really spread the word about it. And the next is Getong. Yeah.
Yes. Hi everyone. I didn't present what Avelo France or the, the the Federation back in my presentation uh, uh, back then. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to present you what Avelo France. So it was created the uh, national organization. It was created in 2019, right? Um, mm -hmm. Back then we were almost two two people working at the organizations, and now we are almost. 15 to 16, so it shows in maybe three or uh, four years that we've we've had a huge development, and also I, I think it's a quite unique context. We had a a good political support in in France, and we had a huge resources coming to us. We have so much money, we don't know what to do with it, right? No, I'm kidding. We know what to do with it. Um, so Boitavelo France, we try to gather service companies, craftsmanship, uh, food bikes, all professionals and companies that are using mainly cargo bikes to uh, uh, do their daily uh, trips. And we also gather manufacturers and retailers. I will talk about it uh, just uh, after. So the French one, obviously. And the last part is the cycle logistics operators. So that's what I presented. Um, back then, and we we created the French Federation of Cycle Logistics, and it was quite a, also a political move uh, because it, it gave us um, the position to to talk for the profession, talk for the companies, and um, the timing was was good because it, it gave us more resources focused on the cycle logistics uh, uh, thematics. So what we're doing in Botavelo France. We have some projects with training, training uh, psychologistics professional. Back then, we were doing Massic Entreprise, which is um, kind of the same as Kergo Bike. I don't know if you know about this one. So it was training uh, companies, uh, multiple companies, um, to implement cargo bikes in their activities. And now we are focusing on the with the program Cyclo Cargology. We are focusing with uh, training in cycle logistics operators companies. The next one is, of course, promoting, uh, talking to companies that don't have cargo bikes, talking to cities that want to implement cargo bikes, and um, of course, lobbying, uh, talking with the government, uh, talking, talking about the regulations, um, the subsidies, things like this. The last things we do is related to our subject today. It's um, the survey that we are conducting and that gives us also, it's, it's a really good tool to, um, to talk about our subjects and to gain trust also with our government, right? And um, talking to the technicians in the government, they expect us to produce this kind of survey and um, it's a really good way for us to, to talk with them and to show them how it's developing and why we have to support it. <laughs> so on the left, we add a specific um, manufacturer survey. So you have here more than 50 manufacturers in France. And um, this one, I just presented it uh, maybe one hour ago. It is about the cycle logistics operator sectors in France. That's all. Okay, we, we hope you have a good overview on the European Federation side and their uh, different activities. You may have also uh, recognized that the national associations that spoke have different foci. So uh, the, the Cycle Logistics uh, Association in Germany has manufacturers represented and operators represented. The Belgians have only operators. Boitavillo in France has also manufacturers and operators, but in different subgroups. And uh, my organization, my association, Zukunft Fahrrad, speaks for the whole uh, bicycle industry, except for the uh, Cycle Logistics sector, because this is done in Germany by uh, uh, the Cyclogistics uh, Association Tom represents. 
Um, <clears throat> but to bring all of this together uh, in a joint European effort of our industry, um, yeah, we need to unite. And that's what uh, we have been planning this morning and yesterday evening over lunch. So this is a little bit uh, history in the making. <laughs> and we have some kind of uh, concluding activity. Who of you wants to? Uh, first of all, Cycling Industries Europe gives us the umbrella of uh, continuing this joint cargo bike uh, work, cycle logistics work that have been previous done by these European Union funded projects, cycle logistics and uh, city changer cargo bike. So that's why I think uh, Sam should, uh, representing um, Cycling Industries Europe, should have a few words on that as well. Uh, well, I, <laughs> it predates me, uh, and I think a lot of this is um, obviously uh, was, was established during these two projects that you see up on screen here, Cycle Logistics. Um, there was a second Cycle Logistics project, and then a third one uh, called the City Changer Cargo Bike. And, and this has been... Uh, a, fund, uh, a project funded by the European Union um, to to scale up personal and um, commercial use of, of cargo bikes. Um, and a lot of the association work for the cycle logistics sector um, had been set up by uh, a man here in uh, the audience, Richard Armitage. Did you want to jump up, Richard? <laughs> Did you want to come up here and uh, just give a bit of a, a backstory and, uh, and, and context and explain to everyone uh, what the history was behind everything and... Yeah, have you got a few days? I'll try and be very fast. Uh, I'm Richard Armitage. I'm here wearing my hat as a director of Manchester Bikes, which is a cargo bike retailer in the north of England. Um, but for 10 years, I was the executive director of the European Cycle Logistics Federation. So I have a few things to say. Um, the one big bit that's been missing today and which is completely current before I go into history uh, and I'll whip through it is that uh, over in uh, the UK, we do have um, a form of representation for cycle logistics and cargo bikes, but it's different again and it's only just getting going. For, for several years, we had a UK Cycle Logistics Federation. But what happened is that 12 months ago, um, the UK CLF dissolved itself and we reversed ourselves into the uh, Bicycle Association, which is the UK cycle industry trade body. So on the one hand, we've lost our independence as a trade association, UK CLF. But on the other hand, we've mainstreamed cargo bikes and cycle logistics in the UK trade body. And I think that that was a very, very worthwhile trade-off. Um, we've copied the Cycling Industries Europe format, and we've got a cargo bikes and cycle logistics experts group, and it's been meeting regularly, and we meet again on Wednesday this next week. About 35 people from the industry attend a mix of cycle logistics operators, some manufacturers, very small group, and uh, some retailers. Um, in the last 12 months, we've employed somebody who's a, a very experienced cycling journalist and con cycling consultant for 10 months to get us going. And he's done a great job, Andrew. And we've got a web presence on the Bicycle Association website. There wasn't one before. On 31st of March this year, we had a cargo bike summit of 200 delegates, exhibition and so on. It was extremely successful politically very useful because it was in the middle of London um, and um, the next one's being planned for May 24. We've drafted a UK standard for cargo bike rider training and that will, I hope, following discussions this week, uh, become a contributor to a European standard and we've also got an operator and rider code of practice drafted, um, which surprisingly is producing some controversy, but we'll see where that goes. Also, by being in the trade body, we've benefited from their electronic point of sale market data service. 
so the data is sucked out of the retailer's systems and put straight into the analysis, anonymized, and it's extremely powerful. We've got nearly 80% of all bike sales on that. We're just waiting to be able to pick out the cargo bike sales. It's coming. On top of that, we've got a new diversity, equality, and inclusion program of work, which is modernizing the cycle industry. Long overdue. If you've got too many white, white-haired old men like me talking, and not enough women, uh, and not enough brown faces, and all the rest, and it's coming. Um, we've also uh, just this week launched the Cycle Industry Manifesto, and in the UK, it was launched in Parliament. And in, in the UK, that is the first time that we've ever had an attempt to have a cycle industry growth plan for the industry as a whole. It's, a, it's actually a, a historic moment. It was launched this week. Um, and we, as the cargo, bike, and cycle logistics part of um, the Bicycle Association, we are in there as part of the plan. And so um, we're actually uh, at one with all of the colleagues behind. And um, the ECLF, the European Cycle Logistics Federation, has come to a natural end in July 22. Um, but what we've got to do uh, over the next period is decide how we represent cycle logistics and cargo bike manufacture and so on in Europe on a more cohesive basis going forward. Obviously, Cycling Industries Europe has uh, got a role to play in this, but I think there's a discussion to be had with the CIE board, sorry about this, uh, about resources and the necessary resources being found to actually do this properly. I think that's a key issue. Um, and I think that um, uh, we also need to have a look at events that we run. Um, bluntly, there aren't enough people present today who should be here. And um, we've got a string of exhibitions and conferences happening all over Europe now, and they can't all work to get everybody together. It's just not going to happen. We need to have a rethink about how we do this so that we actually maximize the impact. There's been some very, very high quality uh, presentations uh, this last two days. I've really enjoyed them, but it's been to my new audiences and that's just no good. Um, so we've got to um, uh, gear up, we've got to grow, we've got to scale up. Um, you heard Arne earlier, we have not got a cargo bike manufacturer making 100,000 sales a year yet. Well, you know, we really need to get there. Um, so there's some ambition needed, there's some scale needed, there's some investment needed, but it's all to go for, it's all to play for. Um, and uh, I'm, my, my fault in life is I'm a permanent optimist. I think we're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, yeah, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, our session today. I think we're sort of straight on time. So uh, thank you everyone for turning up. And uh, yeah, please watch this space. Some exciting things happening. So see you soon. Maybe at the end, a big warm applause for Richard for all he has built up over the last 10 years as director of the European Cycle Logistics Federation. And Richard, you can be assured the national federations are taking over what you have built up and uh, we will win the battle. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There is some quest. So, yeah. After we have the end. So, real quick question. I wanted to become a member of CIE as a consumer because I've replaced... I know that. Uh, you talk about driving up uh, membership and dynamics. You know, it would be great if people like Martin Schmidt, who spoke earlier someone like that who's an unvarnished voice for um, cargo bikes, if there's a way, because many of us would be willing to spend 50 euros or 100 euros a year to be a member. I know the minimum is 500, something to consider. So Martin Schmidt, by the way, is a member of, uh, with his company, a member of uh, Zukunft Fahrrad and also a co-founder and a member and a board member of uh, uh, the German Cycle Logistics uh, Federation. But 
we as organizations have all different terms of membership, but it's all companies. So for individuals, it's the, um, yeah, the, the national cyclists' federations who we work with uh, very well. Anna Karina of the European Cyclists Federation was here. They was, she was part of the Cyclogistics project. Uh, but I also hand over to other colleagues. I, I, you, you've picked up a very good point. And, and because we're wrapping up, I'm going to be very quick. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. But what I would say is that all the national trade bodies and the European trade bodies have got a problem here, right? I can say this now because I'm no longer so close in. Um, I think that, that we need a, a form of associate membership without voting rights. It's as simple as that, right? And, and they need to stop ignoring this problem. This includes you at CIE, right? I've had words with Kevin about this. You know that. Um, and we need a form of membership for supporters. So there needs to be a supporter avenue into these, these associations. I realize that constitutionally, it's awkward, right, because of the structures. And by the way, to be fair to the, the, these bodies, they have to be very, very, very careful about competition law, right? There are, the rules around competition law are so punitive financially, if you get it wrong, that, that there is great difficulties around there technically to do this. But it's doable. It's not impossible. And I would like our supporters to be able to join in. Point taken. <laughs> Maybe to add and also a call on all companies that are represented here, become a member of one of these organizations. It's so important when you want to be, uh, when we want politically in the game with the car industry, with the other industries, we need strong associations and we need all of you as members. Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Any other question? No? So big applause for all of you. Thank you very much for your time.